We astrophotographers are often taught to shun focal length. After all, high focal length telescopes are inherently more difficult to use. They are likely to show any little flaw in guiding or tracking. So better mounts, better guiding, and better guiding cameras are required, as well as better skill in the application of that equipment. Low focal length telescopes, on the other hand, are going to be more tolerant of small flaws in guiding. Thus, a person can use a less expensive or less than perfect mount, and with a bit less skill. Low focal length telescopes also have the advantage of showing you wider spaces of sky, so you can shoot large DSOs such as the Rosette Nebula in a single frame. And if your focal length is low enough, you can capture dramatic and beautiful images of sky objects against backdrops such as the Milky Way. While high focal length telescopes will give you a narrower field of view, generally restricting them to specific targets. But there is an inherent advantage in that narrower field of view. High focal length telescopes will provide much more magnification, allowing you to get much closer views of whatever target you're aiming at, and bringing otherwise tiny and distant objects such as faraway galaxies into view and perhaps even being able to fill the frame with them. And when you image those deep sky objects with a high focal length telescope, the images will be sharp, crisp, and clear. Now I have suspect that part of the reason that high focal length telescopes are also out of favor is because currently in astrophotography there is a predilection for refractor telescopes. It is guided by a myth that refractor telescopes are inherently better. I was even reading in a post in a forum just a couple days ago where somebody had noted that they did not like Cassegrain telescopes because the images produced by them were soft compared to refractors. To me, this notion that refractors are inherently better, these are odd myths, little different than a superstition. Because the simple fact is, the best telescopes currently in existence, the James Webb Telescope and the Hubble, are both cast grain telescopes, reflector telescopes. And there are numerous videos floating around YouTube where persons have compared the qualities of refractor telescopes versus reflector telescopes. And by and large, they show up as comparable. Pretty consistently, refractors seem to give a bit better contrast and saturation. Though, to me, that's barely an advantage at all. Contrast and saturation are among the easiest things to compensate for in post-processing. But the current predilection for refractor telescopes might also play some role, I think, in providing another reason for why low focal length telescopes are also somewhat preferred these days. High focal length telescopes will benefit from aperture. The more aperture, the better because aperture equals light collecting ability, which is important because high focal length telescopes also tend to be slow. They have high F ratings and need to be able to capture more light. And also, to make the most of that magnification, you want high aperture because higher aperture allows you to resolve more detail. But wide aperture refractors are difficult to make, and once you cross over about 80 millimeters in aperture, they go up in cost very quickly. For example, my 81mm Williams Optics Refractor costs 1200 Canadian, but its 91mm cousin from the same manufacturer costs nearly $2,700 Canadian, and its 120mm cousin, also from the same manufacturer, costs nearly 4500 Canadian. So, given how expensive wide aperture refractors can become, and very quickly once we get past about 80 to 100 millimeters. I can see yet another reason for which a preference may have evolved for lower focal length telescopes. But if we can get past this strange bias against reflector telescopes that, well, not everybody in the astrophotography community has it, but plenty enough do. And if we can get past that and discover the affordable power of wide aperture, high focal length reflector telescopes, then we discover right there in front of us an ability to close in on distant, tiny deep sky objects and resolve detail like never before, because focal length, along with aperture, have qualities all their own. So that's the talk. Let's take a look at a simple comparison that I've thrown together here. The first image I'm going to show you, I made with the Williams Optics Zenith Star 81mm doublet Apo refractor. Wow, that's a mouthful, isn't it? But with its reducer corrector, it has a focal length of 447 millimeters. That's not really low, it's not high, it's respectable. But all things considered, it's not a huge amount of focal length. And of course, it's a Xenostar 81, which means it has 81 millimeters of aperture. Meaning the lens at the front of the telescope has 81 millimeters or just under 3.19 inches of diameter. 
And using this telescope, in combination with an uncooled Player One Uranus C, which uses the Sony IMX585 sensor, a very good sensor, I was able to shoot this image of the Horsehead Nebula and the Flame Nebula and the surrounding nebulosity. In 2023, this image is a composite made of dual band image shot late last summer and broadband image later in autumn. It's also been developed and sharpened with techniques that I haven't gotten around to discussing yet. Videos on these techniques are coming soon. It'll take several videos to go over them. But will suffice it to say right now that I believe I've gotten as much detail and as much sharpness and color I can out of the information that that telescope was able to capture. And I'm very happy with this image. Technically, it's a good image and I think it looks great. However, ever since seeing a Hubble image of the Horsehead Nebula, I have been wanting to really bring some focal length to bear on the Horsehead itself. And the weather has really been working against me. There has not been a single good night to really do this since I put the SCT up on the mount in the observatory. I hope the weather will become cooperative soon because the window to shoot the horse head is getting shorter and shorter. But last week, there was a night of, it was poor seeing and there were plenty of clouds, but I was still able to get some time, about an hour and a half on the horse head nebula. And that hour and a half revealed the value and the power of focal length and aperture when we really want to get in close and take a good look at a specific DSO. Using the SCT on a terrible night, I was able to shoot this. The sky was half filled with clouds and to make matters worse, the air was filled with ice. So the scene was, well, it was poor. It wasn't even okay, it was poor. To shoot this image, I had to take advantage of momentary breaks in the clouds and momentary improvements in the seeing. So I shot one minute subs of which about 90 were usable. This image was shot with the Celestron 8-inch SCT with a reducer corrector. That gave the SCT 1240 millimeters of focal length, about three times that of the refractor. And the 8-inch SCT also has almost three times the aperture. So this reflector telescope is able to magnify much more than the refractor can, and its water aperture allows it to capture more detail. Thus, even with the poor shooting conditions, I was able to produce this image. I used a different camera for this image, a Player One Ares M, which has larger pixels that are more suited to the higher focal length of the SCT telescope. And because of the terrible weather and the relatively short window to capture any good images, this image was only shot on the luminance channel. The color for the image was pulled from the previous image that I had taken with the refractor. I'm really eager to see what kind of outcome I can get when I have the telescope at its full over 2,000 millimeters of focal length on this target all night on a good crystal clear night of great seeing. But for now, I'm pretty happy with this, and I think it illustrates the point perfectly. Aperture and focal length have a quality all their own. This next image is the great globular cluster in Hercules. This was shot on a night of very good seeing, perhaps excellent, using the Williams Optics Refractor, which has 447 millimeters of focal length. Once again, it's an okay image. I was happy with it, considering what the telescope is capable of. But the globular cluster is fairly small within it, and the stars are not highly resolved, and that is a result of the relatively narrow aperture of the telescope. It just doesn't have the resolution required to really get them. Here is the same target, the great globular cluster in Hercules, shot a few weeks ago with a 203mm SCT telescope. The seeing conditions on that night were pretty similar to the seeing conditions last time. And not only are we able to resolve a great many of the stars within that globular cluster, but there is a tiny galaxy just off to the side of the cluster, IC4617, shown here. With the 81mm refractor, it simply is not resolved at all. Next, we have the Pinwheel Galaxy. This was shot with the 81mm refractor about midsummer. But once again, I, it's okay. But at magnitude 7.9, it's not a very dim galaxy. And that narrow aperture, even though it was on it all night, was only able to capture about this. This image of it, shot with a 203mm SCT, was actually the very first image that I ever took with that telescope, as well as the first image I ever took with the Player One Ares M camera. That first usage was just a calibration run while I was getting the whole system working together smoothly. And even then, that telescope pulled in this kind of detail, even though at the same time as I was using it, 
A Player One engineer was online adjusting the firmware on my Phoenix filter wheel to set the filter wheel to work better in the extremely cold temperatures that we encounter here in Canada. This next image is the Leo triplet, which I imaged late last summer. And it's not bad for what one can accomplish with an 81 millimeter aperture, 447 millimeter focal length telescope. But the Hamburger Galaxy, visible on the left side, also known as Ceres Galaxy, is an exceedingly interesting galaxy because not only is it on its side to us, allowing us a great view of the dust along its galactic plane, but the galaxy is being somewhat warped by the two neighboring galaxies on the right of the image. Yet, attempting to zoom in on it with that 81mm refractor can produce at most this. But when filmed with a higher focal length and higher aperture telescope, such as the 203mm SCT, we can pull so much more detail out of the image. And ultimately, we are left with an image like this, showing structure and the color in the galaxy's dust lanes. Let's take a look at one last example. This is an image of the Iris Nebula that I shot last spring using the Williams Optic Xenostar 81mm Apo Refractor. There was a lot of walking noise in the image and that was totally my fault. I meant to tell the mount to dither every three frames, which is pretty standard when I'm shooting five minute subs. And I don't know, by mouse slip or whatever, I, I deleted that entry. So as far as the mount was concerned, it was not dithering at all. Anyway, I stripped the walking noise out with some aggressive editing. And here we have the finished result of the Iris Nebula. But because the Iris was so small in the original image, it has been cropped in by 200%. The image is soft. The detail within the nebula is it's not very well resolved. And this is because cropping isn't the same thing as focal length. As we crop in, essentially what we're doing is just spreading out the information portrayed in the pixels, making the information conveyed with them take up more space on the screen. Let's crop in by about 400% and take an even closer look. As you can see, every time we crop in, the image gets softer. It's more spread out on the screen, so we have an illusion that we are seeing more detail. But really, we're not seeing more detail. We're just seeing this nebula taking up more space all over the screen. Now let's take a look at the Iris Nebula that I shot just a week ago using the 203mm aperture, 1240mm focal length SCT telescope. The difference in this image is immediately striking. Far more detail in every sense of the word has been captured here. There is more color and more structure in the nebulosity revealed in this image. And this image is not cropped at all. This is a one-to-one -one representation of what the camera caught. Let's go ahead and crop in by about 50% and see what it looks like. With such a small crop, we retain the detail and sharpness, while at the same time enhancing our review of the Iris Nebula. And not just the main body of the nebula at its core, but the cloud structure all around. And what you are seeing right here is the power of high focal length combined with a very wide aperture. And this is why astrophotographers are always looking for telescopes that have wider apertures. Not necessarily focal lengths, but wider apertures. Wider apertures allow us to resolve more information. And so, in the quest for wider apertures, even refractor users will consider paying the enormous prices of wide aperture refractors. But, when you combine a wide aperture with a high focal length, you are able to get very close to those deep sky objects and take advantage of that aperture to resolve details that otherwise you might miss entirely. And the best way I know to combine a wide aperture with a high focal length is by way of a reflector telescope. It may take a little more work, but they're worth it because high focal length and high aperture, I know I sound like a broken record here, but they do have a quality all their own. As always, thank you for watching. And if you have any thoughts or comments, please leave them below. Now have fun and get out there and shoot the sky.